Thank you all for being here at this early time, for some journalists at least. <laughs> um, that's why one of our um, fellows will be a bit late and we saved him a seat here. Um, so we're all current or former Reuters fellows um, at the Journalism Institute uh, in Oxford, at the Reuters Institute, and um, we will all give lightning talks on our research topics that we already did and finished or ha are still doing. And yeah, we'll just start. And if you have any questions, please save them for the end, and we will answer them afterwards. Thank you. Okay, it's working. Great. Hi, um, I'm Chingyi. I'm very grateful to be given the opportunity to present here the topic of my research. And I'll jump right into the background uh, as to what led to uh, the proposal for my research. Basically, if we think of um, journalism as a service, uh, a public service, the accountability of a journalist is to the end consumer, which is the reader or uh, subscriber. And then if we think of journalism as any old regular business and a newspaper um, as a product, the news media organizations have to be accountable to the shareholders. But unfortunately, um, the drive for survival makes news media a commercial-driven concern and pop, a popularity contest rather than a public service uh, with freedom of expression. And uh, basically, according to the Freedom House, only 13% of the world's population enjoyed a free press in 2017, whereas at the other end of the spectrum, 45% of the world's population live in countries where the operating environment for the media is considered not free. Um, so therein lies this two-pronged problem. Not only is journalism not financially viable, it is, so, it is also one of the most dangerous professions in the world. So um, here's what's threatening journalists around the world. And um, basically, in light of these two issues, I began to think, um, you know, pretty much of all the usual questions, you know, um, what type of news would readers pay for? Because clearly, the content is not uh, the public is not entirely adverse to paying for content. We can look towards Spotify and Netflix and ex examples in other industries where consumers are willing to pay for them for, for the content. And then, um, perhaps the only way to find out is to turn this question to the media companies, which have already gone on sort of a fight or flight mode uh, to survive. And um, um, I've sort of borrowed a term, which is sort of in vogue in, in the business community, um, came up with my research question where, you know, what tactics do uh, news media organizations um, employ to survive in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous economic and political uh, environments? So that's my early hypothesis, uh, as well as uh, if I flip it around, um, the other, I could put it the other way as well, where you know, the more monopolistic the media ownership in any country, the fewer um, various streams that it employs, because there's really no need to figure out uh, uh, how to find other funders where you have the government uh, funding your operations. And pretty much, um, I'm looking at these countries, and um, I'm using the definition from Freedom House to define the free press as one, a media environment where the coverage of political news is robust, two, the safety of journalists is guaranteed, and three, state intrusion um, in media affairs is minimal, and four, the press is not subject to honors, legal, or uh, economic pressures. Um, basically, this is a map of the 2017 World Press Freedom Index from uh, Reporters Without uh, Borders. It, sort of tallies with um, the one from uh, Freedom House as well. And uh, this is a quick look uh, at what I've done so far, pretty much. Um, many of the news media, uh, media news outlets now have more than one or two sources of income, um, but many still really uh, predominantly rely on advertisements or reader subscriptions. And I'll uh, do a quick jump and, you know, just to focus on Malaysia. Um, 
So very briefly, the uh, repression of the media in Malaysia can be traced back to the colonial times where uh, the laws were just left behind and not changed and kept intact. And then as time went on, the uh, government decided to add more and more laws just to regulate the media. Um, and then at one point, uh, they were even discussing, um, and at this point, they, they are regulating the internet as well. They pretty much have the the uh, Malaysian Communications of Multimedia and Commission uh, Act, where this commission is just to look at um, um, the internet. And the most recent one, and probably the most repressive, is the last one, the anti-fake news bill that just passed by a few uh, weeks ago. Uh, pretty much I highlighted this because that was one of the worst crackdown um, that involved uh, three papers uh, being uh, um, sort of closed down momentarily. But um, the star is still around, Watan has disappeared, and uh, Sin Chiu Jipo is, um, is still around. Um, the thing is, the trend of the uh, papers shutting down after having their licenses uh, suspended or revoked is, is still, it still holds true today. And the reason they shut down uh, afterwards mostly is because, you know, after you've been suspended, um, you just uh, lose tr uh, the trust, you just lose advertisers, and pretty much um, in, um, in the end, you'll face financial constraints. And pretty much ironically, this uh, clip also came from the Malaysian Insider, where um, the, uh, it was, uh, they closed down in 2015, and then the same editor opened up uh, Malaysian Insight, which also recently had to shut down, and both of them was because of uh, financial constraints. And pretty much, I'll just zoom through this. Um, and Malaysians are a bit notorious for not really paying for uh, um, content, and pretty much they, um, I guess the media has to be really, um, uh, uh, creative, and then they come up with a lot of other ways to uh, fund their operations. And pretty much, um, what's next? Um, I guess if we look towards the West for uh, guidance, uh, the idea is still to di diversify the revenue streams. And um, but really, my question is, you know, uh, will adding more streams help when there are uh, oppressive laws uh, at hand? That sort of um, the that sort of, uh, uh, yeah, hold away. So anyway, thank you. Okay, welcome, Stuart. <laughs> so we're all complete now. Um, and I will talk about a totally different topic. Hold on. My name is Bettina Fiegel, um, I'm from Austria, and my research was about data journalism in small newsrooms. The title is Bigger is Not Always Better, What We Can Learn About Data Journalism from Small Newsrooms. And just a quick explanation why, I'm right, why I wrote or took this topic. Uh, I work for a newspaper in Vienna, which uh, was founded 1703. <coughs> it's the oldest newspaper that's still being published. And it's a bit, um, of course, a huge tradition, but also the newsroom is very traditionally. And I wanted to know if it's possible to do data journalism in a small newsroom like this, in a traditional one. And um, yeah, so I came up with my research question um, and my hypothesis that it, you don't really need to be big to do good data journalism. And I looked at um, companies, mostly in Germany, um, to find out if this is true. So the research questions is, are what, what makes date, uh, great data journalism? How can newsrooms become more data savvy? And what are actually their advantages? And my research methods was, of course, literature, case studies, but mainly um, interviews with the heads of data teams in Germany. Um, I took Germany because it's culturally very similar to Austria, where I'm from, and there has not been much research yet. Um, and those are the, the people I talked to, so you probably recognize the companies to the right. Those are the big ones. And to the left are more the small <coughs> startups, like, for example, Journal Code is a small data startup in Germany. Correctiv is a, a non-profit in Germany. Dossier is a non-profit data 
um, outlet in, in Austria. Then Anastasia is a former Reuters fellow who is a freelance data journalist in Russia. And the Bureau Local was founded um, last March, uh, March 2017, and is in London, and they connect uh, local data journalism um, outlets. So I'll come to my key findings. Well, the first one is that data journalism is definitely a team sport. All of the teams I talked to really um, cooperate. And um, what was really interesting was that usually the sizes of the teams are quite similar. And it didn't really make a difference if it's a big a newsroom or a small one. So you can see all the, the, the size. It's kind of ranging from five to seven. And um, they have very diverse backgrounds, which is interesting. So I talked to teams with physicists <coughs> and city planners and coders and traditional journalists. So quite, quite a range, but not so much in gender. Um, so this would be the typical um, team I saw. But what was interesting is that often it was led by a woman. So yeah. No. And there are several advantages for small newsrooms. You can communicate better. It's easier to cooperate and experiment. One quote I got was, if we do something wrong at uh, Berliner Morgenpost, nobody's going to see it. If we do something really spectacular, everybody will um, talk about it. Um, and change can happen faster. So it's also easier to come, become enthusiastic. And there's more permeability because often it's necessary to really lobby as a data journalist and talk to IT and go up to people. And um, one best practice I found was, as I mentioned, Berliner Morgenpost. And it's really interesting because they're quite similar in size to my newspaper. So there are 90 in total. Data team um, uh, is of six people right now. And you really can see that it, um, how it started. It's, it's like this fairy tale story. Just within three, three years, um, Julius Tröger went out to New York and did um, internships at The Guardian and ProPublica and learned how to do data journalism there. Um, and within a few years, they got so many rewards and uh, journalism awards. And now, actually, people go there to intern and go back to their companies and, and start a data journalism team on their own there. And um, I talked to him a lot, to be, um, Julius, and he told me about the change that was happening in his newsroom. So usually it was a very traditional newsroom. The, uh, the, it has kind of almost a dusty image, the, the newspaper. And then the editors um, started noticing when, when the data team did great things because their kids would come up to them and say, hey, I saw your newspaper is doing really great stuff. And then they started wanting to work with them. So the uh, wanting really needs to come from the um, journalists. And oh, I'm too long. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I will uh, rush through. You already read the quote. Um, it's good to make it personal by databases. It's good to give a gamification approach, is what I found. And uh, crowdsourcing data journalism um, is also a great method. But I mean, my, my, news, my, my paper is already published, so you can read it online at the Reuters Institute's homepage. And <laughs> um, collaborations are really essential for, for small newsrooms as well. And yeah, some challenges are the Freedom of Information Act, sometimes in, in countries like my own. <coughs> And to get started, you um, should follow those things. And, and uh, you really, what's really important is commitment from the top and enthusiasm from the bottom. And it's not rocket science. It's the quote I heard the most by all my interview partners. So you should just get started. OK, thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. Um, in the interest of time and also because my research is uh, still a work in progress, I will do things a little bit differently, different from what they have been doing. Uh, my name is Intibing and I'm a journalist from Botswana. Um, well, you are in the newsroom. You have been in journalism for, 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 for some years now. You have moved through the ranks from a, from a, a hungry, an angry reporter to an editor. You have seen it all. For some reasons, you feel tired, so frustrated. 
so demoralized, so uninspired. Things are not going well. You're frustrated. Frustrated with the media establishment. Frustrated with the wealthy media owners. Frustrated because few days ago, few weeks ago, few months ago, you asked for more resources and time. More resources to do investigative work, more time to do investigative work. You have asked for support to go after the bad guys, the politicians, the super rich, the untouchables, the corrupt, and of course, all of them, they are the powerful. All these requests have been refused on account of lack of resources. Well, there you are. You are in the newsroom, and you are frustrated with owners of news, the publishers frustrated because of lack of support. You are frustrated that you can't do what you like. You are frustrated because you can't, you can't dig, dig, dig deep. You are frustrated because you can't be a journalist you want to be. What do you do? You ask yourself. You organize, you organize, and agonize. In frustration, and of course out of frustration, you want action. You call a friend, a fellow editor, you share your plan, a plan to build a new model of investigative journalism. A nonprofit, well, some will say a more independent model. Let's go for it, comrade, he says. Two other comrades join the course. Well, there you are again. You sit together somewhere with your comrades at a low income hotel at the heart of the city. You agree that corruption is rampant. You agree that corruption is at its greatest height. Well, but there is a problem. Newspapers are weak. Publishers are compromised. Is this about saving journalism? Is this about saving the newspapers? Of course not. Let the messiahs do the saving. You agree. This is about holding power to account. The powerful to account. <laughs> a few months later, the center is up and running. Of course, you are no longer the, in that mainstream newsroom. The newsroom is no longer in you. You have passed this, the, the process and stage of detoxification. You feel liberated. You feel free. Free from the, from the bondage of advertisers. Free from the ignorance of the publishers. Well, a year later, not all is well and good. Of course it's not. What did you expect, a miracle? The other two comrades have left the project. They can't take it. Freedom is sweet. Independence is sweet. But where is the money? Where is the comfort? They ask. Two years later, your sacrifices are too much. Your sting is too powerful to ignore. The impact is so great to imagine. You have been part of this and that. You have exposed the president's self-enrichment project. You have been part of the Panama Papers project. You have investigated the rich and powerful. Well, boy, you are holding power to account. You are asking tough questions. You are exposing corruption. You are creating enemies. Now they are saying you are a CIA agent because, of course, you are getting funding from, well, international donors. A gun has been pointed in your direction. You have been threatened with violence. Your offices have been broken into. But there's something. Your quest and your thirst for truth remain unbroken. I is it worth it? Of course it is. It comes with the tough anyway. You are no Superman, you are no hero. Of course you are not. The work is done, your work is done in, in darkness. Your name is not etched in the halls of heroes. After all, you are not of the fame or fortune. You have not embarked on a just, you have only embarked on a just cost, a just cause to promote and defend and enrich democracy through the tools of, of investigative journal, journalism. The, the, the question is, how are the similar centers of investigative journalism in Africa doing? Centers in, you know, in South Africa, in Malawi, 
in Namibia, in Nigeria, in Lesotho, and many other countries in, 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 in Africa. How are they doing? In the past few weeks, few months, at the Reuters Institute at the University of Oxford, I've been searching for this truth. I've been examining the structures, the motivations behind the formations of these centers, and, as, and, and assessing their impact in the African continent. Well, the simple argument is that as fringe as they are, as disorganized as some of them are, as poor as they are in terms of resources, non-profit uh, investigative journalism centers have a role to play in our, you know, in our continent and are holding power to account. In my research, I'm using three theories, the agenda setting you know, theory, the media ownership theory, and also the social responsibility theory. Thank you. Hi, I'm standing up because I need to see my phone. So, uh, I'm Emelena from Finland and I'm a visual journalist turning into a digital storyteller. And I've been studying that mobile phone screen, how to fit news on that tiny little screen. It's a challenge. Why I'm doing this? It's because there is almost 3.6 billion smartphone users in the world soon. And they read news in the bed and they access news in the toilet. And there we want to be, there where they ha have time. And this is also why. This is picture that I took two weeks ago in New York subway. There are 85% of those people were reading their news from the, uh, their phones. But there was one book a revisionist there. So I've done eight interviews, uh, heads of visuals, designers, or interactive journalists from eight different newsrooms. And there's a part of some re reflections in here. I try to adapt the digital <coughs> skills and tools in the newsrooms there that they are using. Uh, those are the people that uh, I interviews from BBC, from over 20,000 employees to four people Putting, uh, putting website, online native website. And there's the categories I put them in. Yes, is, and this is Amanda Farnsworth for PBC who is telling us that. And she's also my supervisor. The, the best skills that you could have as a designer or a journalist is a sense of storytelling and that's the first thing that everyone mentions when I ask, what is the best skill to do? Of course, you have to have desire to learn and maybe start with the visual things. This is Larry Buchanan from New York Times where they have privilege to start with visuals. They have a huge department of visual journalists who start with the visual ideas and do them themselves. Cooperation is the buzzword nowadays. So people cooperate within the newsroom and outside the newsroom. Actually, New York, uh, Washington Post have been doing a lot of work with platforms as well because they think the audience, the future audience is in the platforms. And this is Chris from Washington Post. So do you need to know code? Four says not necessary. Three, yes, absolutely. One, no. Because you can do this stuff with, with PowerPoint, like you can see. But NBC's Nelson Sue says that you definitely want to know how to code because you need to know the restri restrictions of your medium. Or possibilities as well. So 85% of New York Times interactive content were not touched at all. So where does it leave the interaction? You don't hide anything behind tabs, but you need to have interaction because it helps explore data and be more transparent to the audience. So uh, The Guardian's Theresa Malone is coming next to say that it gives people more meaningful content from, from by interacting with, with the pieces.
And does it leave uh, space for creativity? It's a challenge to fit everything on a mobile screen, but you have to embrace the boundaries, says uh, Washington Post Chris, which I think is the, the most important message. You, have, you can do a lot of things with the mobile phone. And you add value to that as well, because you are not anymore in the end of the production line, but they, people come to you because they need, need your visual skills. You have to be curious, you have to do ex experiments, you have to fail, and you have to take risks. Uh, but never, never annoy the reader, because reader is going to be away uh, after one swipe if you make them unhappy. Have empathy for, for the reader, so you have to think a lot about that, what reader and the audience wants. And that's Pudding's uh, David <laughs> there. What these mediums have in common? They all employed visual journalists within last year. And they will continue to do so. There are a lot of visual profession out there. A visual assistant brings, builds trust, it shows, and it helps understand the world, and uh, mostly it engages people to the media. Thank you. I'm just gonna use this one. Yep. Let's see. Hi, my name is uh, Ingrid Salvesen. I'm a journalist from uh, Norway. I've been covering uh, climate change, science, and politics a lot for the last years. And my research at the Reuters Institute uh, is trying to find some answers to questions I've been struggling, struggling with and that I think are important for a time as journalists. So, firstly, how do you make uh, journalism on climate change that engages the public? And what is the role of journalists, if any, in addressing or even helping to solve this planetary crisis? Uh, I've just started my research, but I'd be happy to share with you what I've got so far. So this is a journalist. Uh, on the one side, she knows a lot about the terrible consequences that climate change is already having uh, and will be having. On the other side is what her editor, colleagues, and even herself is saying when she tries to make journalism on it. And uh, climate change has been said to be rarely resistant uh, to journalism because it's abstract, technical, far away in time and place. And so uh, if you are a journalist wanting to cover it, it's hard not to go like, what do I do? Or you can go like this, uh, which is Alan Respiger. And I uh, see that he's here in the room today. And I'm sorry for choosing this picture uh, where you look very frustrated. Uh, but this is how many journalists uh, feel when uh, they're trying to cover uh, climate uh, change. Um, and the reason you're here, Alan, is that uh, when uh, Alan Respiger was stepping down as an editor of The Guardian in 2015, uh, he said that journalism has failed climate change, um, and he wanted to make a big campaign on it. And if you push on the sound button down there, we can hear what he says about covering uh, climate change. Can you do that, Bettina? If you just push that. Do we have sound? Yeah, I've checked it before. Or if not, I can just paraphrase Alan. Okay, so he said something like, um, and my sound was off. Anyway, what he said was uh, that, um, okay, he said that the climate, um, what can you do to uh, uh, make people sit up and listen and pay attention and care about climate change? And so what he did and The Guardian did was that they started uh, a campaign about it. And this was the front page when they launched the campaign in 2015. It was called Keep It In The Ground. It was uh, two things. First, it was a huge journalistic series on the causes and consequences of climate change. But it was also a campaign asking people to sign up to push two big foundations to divest from oil, uh, coal, and gas. And uh, for the latter part of that campaign, they were accused of being too activistic. So for someone like me who wants to find out uh, new uh, narratives of how to tell stories about climate change, but also what is the role of journalism, this campaign is a perfect object to study. 
So my research questions are, first of all, did the Keep It in the Ground campaign um, succeed in what it intended to do and trying to draw out the lessons from the campaign of what kind of journalism makes people engaged in this topic. Also, as it was accused of being too activistic, um, trying to look at the, uh, the coverage that they did during the campaign and figuring out if making it into a campaign, does it reduce um, the scope of the ideas, perspectives on the topic of divestment, which was the focus on the campaign, but also if it pushes out other topics when it comes to climate change uh, coverage. Uh, and the last question is, how did it challenge uh, the journalistic norms of objectivity and impartiality? And I mean, does it even matter anymore, these ideals? Um, the methodology I'm using to do this is I'm going to interview core actors within and outside of the campaign. I'm also doing a content analysis of some of the journalism that was made during the campaign and comparing it to climate change coverage in um, a newspaper that is similar in uh, reach and profile. So I choose the New York Times. I mean, you can discuss this, but I don't have time. Um, and I'm contextualizing all of these uh, findings with literature on the objectivity ideal, on the nexus between activism and journalism and the history of that. Um, some very preliminary findings um, from the content analysis is that The Guardian did write a lot more about climate change in the campaign period and for uh, how much it, I mean, for the sheer volume of coverage, if that matters, a campaign does uh, help. Um, this is also from the content analysis. Uh, you can see that The Guardian wrote a lot more about divestment than The New York Times did within the campaign period. It's not that surprising since the campaign was about divestment, but it will be interesting to uh, break it down and uh, look at whether or not other topics were pushed away uh, or pushed aside. Um, I've also looked at the tone of the coverage. Um, and this is, uh, as I said, very preliminary, but you can see that the coverage in The Guardian uh, can be deemed to be a bit more activistic than the coverage in The New York Times. Maybe not as surprising because uh, they come from very different traditions, the new, two new papers, and they're also part of two different media systems. In the UK, the papers are a bit more, um, what is case, partisan or activistic in their tone than they are in the US. Um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm reading a lot about um, the holy grail of impartiality in journalism and looking at how it's different, differed traditionally in the US and the UK and Europe. Um, also for context, there is a huge tradition of newspaper campaigning in the UK. Um, and so it is, um, I mean, people are used to uh, papers taking a stance on issues. And so why is it suddenly so much more activistic when it's uh, about uh, climate change, you can ask. Like, what does that tell us about our society or the journalism that we do? Um, I'm looking into the um, uh, history of environmental journalism and how it's always had a very conflicted relationship with activism. And also thinking a lot about whether we see a new generation of journalists now uh, where transparency is a lot more important. And maybe this ideal of objectivity and impartiality is not as important anymore. So thinking hard of questions like that. Um, if you have any ideas on who I should talk to, what I should read when it comes to this uh, nexus of uh, interesting questions, please let me know. This is my email and thank you so far. Okay, so I'm also from Norway. I was a US correspondent uh, up until Trump happened. And so I would like to know how many of you have lied today? Raise a hand. It's a bit early in the morning. Uh, what about this week? Probably. Um, most of us, most of us lie about two times a day. We mostly lie about small things. We make ourselves look better. We make maybe uh, our friends look better. We know that young people lie a little bit more than older people. 
men lie more than women. And there are some people who lie more than uh, the great majority. And the President of the United States is one of these men. So um, there are the hyper liars, the, the people who lie uh, all the time. Uh, and what do we do as journalists when we meet one of these people in power? So we've known that Trump has lied a lot for a long time. This is from the first six months of his campaign. And you can see that uh, PolitiFacts give him a 68% mostly false, false, or pants on fire. That's 68% of what he's been checked on was a blatant falsehood or a blatant lie. Uh, it did not change when he got into the White House. Uh, during his first 40 days in office, he said at least one substantial or clear falsehood or lie every single day. Other, this is from the New York Times, and there are other outlets that have found him lying or saying a falsehood five to six times every day in public. So who knows what he does in private? Um, and all politicians lie, all politicians bend the truth, all politicians spin, uh, but here is also the New York Times trying to show the difference between Obama's eight years, where he delivered 18 substantial falsehoods, and this is Trump, his first 10 months in power. There's 103. So this poses a new challenge for, for journalists, especially political journalists, and it also comes in the midst of the fake news the post-truth crisis, where disinformation is already making people confused and the there's a lot of skepticism to the media as it is. So I wanted to know um, how journalists deal with the lies and falsehoods and if the amount of falsehoods coming from the very top, if it has changed the way political journalism works. So I interviewed journalists and fact-checkers in the US and in France. I'm just, pretend I'm just presenting the US findings here. Um, yeah, I interviewed um, most of the big players in the US media and I looked at the, the choice of, yeah, the choice of words, uh, what words they choose to use when they, when they describe these obvious or less obvious falsehoods. So what do people say? There's huge, uh, this is a huge problem. Um, this also challenges the very American goal of objectivity. How do you say that the president is a liar? Um, there's a lot of focus on the headline. Like here we have, these are both from uh, BuzzFeed. One saying that Trump actually lies. This is a very bold and unusual uh, headline. And then the other one is a bit softer, saying claims without evidence. But what they all focus on here is to present in the headline that this is wrong. Um, the more classical approach, this is from the Washington Post, they strengthen fact-checking departments. Uh, the New York Times had the same uh, approach. Now it stops. Uh, yeah, they just said, we want to do more good journalism. They strengthen their White House uh, team. Um, they just say, we're just going to continue to do what we did. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about what to, wh how to call a lie a lie. To call if you should say, here they say, this is, this is the Huffington Post. They also take a quite bold approach compared to the more traditional outlets. And this is again BuzzFeed that says he lies straight out. They're the most uh, courageous ones here. And there you have the Wall Street Journal. They take a very, very soft approach. They say, they don't even use the words lie, and the same goes with NPR and National Public Radio. They choose to really, really emphasize the neutral. If there is such a thing, the neutral stands in this. And what we know is that when a lie is repeated, it sticks. Even if you do like these people have done in the headlines, say it's not true, people remember it. So about a grand majority of Republicans, for example, still believe that Obama was born outside of the US, even though this has been proven wrong a million times. So the Washington Post told me they tried to cover actions and not words to not get fo not focus too much on on all the lies and see if he actually fulfills his campaign promises. They tried to use more sources off the record. They have a couple of stories with 30 offline sources from the White House. 
but the problem there is that that does not really generate trust in the audience because it's very easy to to question and i talked to another political journalist who said he now doesn't even believe what he reads in other newspapers because he knows how hard it is to report from the White House. Uh, so what we know is that the old dance between the sources and the political journalist has changed. Everything is thrown out, there's a new tune, there's a new relationship, and it's still being um, decided. People don't really know how to deal with this. Um, so the conclusion is, there is a disagreement on the choice of words. Should you use lie? Should you use falsehood? Should you, uh, how to present the headline? Newer outlets like BuzzFeed and Huffington Post seem to adopt quicker to this new and very quickly changing envir political environment. Uh, there's obviously uh, an agreement that things have changed and everybody is searching for solutions. Thank you for your attention. Good morning, everybody. I'm Stuart Lau. I'm also a journalist fellow at the Reuters Institute. I used to be a journalist um, in Hong Kong, working for one of Asia's main English language newspapers covering China. And my current research topic, which is still ongoing, um, concerns um, whether Hong Kong media is still in a good shape in covering China um, 20 years on after the handover from British rule. So a brief introduction to China today. It's the second biggest economy, a lot of you know that, and it's set to overtake the US as early as 2032. In terms of the media market, it is currently the largest in the world with um, 700 odd million popul online population out of a population of 1.3 billion. But the problem facing media and for many ordinary residents as well is, of course, the tight government control over basically every aspect of society. So despite a very um, vibrant media scene in terms of the publications, um, what kind of troubles are we facing and why? Of course, because of the president who just named himself, you know, the president in life a couple of weeks ago. He came to power in 2011, 2012, and then he set up a course quite to the, to the surprise of um, many observers, many journalists, because uh, in the past people would, uh, would have considered him to be a rather liberal kind of politician but of course, as things turned out, it um, didn't happen to be the case. And one of the examples was Liu Xiaobo, um, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate. And he was awarded the prize in 2011 because of his help in um, motivating human rights protection and democracy in China. Uh, he was jailed by Chinese authorities and the Nobel Committee um, gave him the prize according to the picture on the left. And what happened? He was since in jail, and uh, from the picture on the right, as you can see, he was uh, he actually he, um, he ended up dying uh, under detention last year. And what do you see if you only turn on the newspaper, turn on the TV in China? That's the main newspaper in China. On the next day, you can see Xi Jinping, the president, was meeting a Canadian official. Uh, that's number one. Number two, the premier meeting a Canadian official and so on and so forth. You wouldn't see a word about the Nobel Peace Prize laureate, who was actually China's first one, dying in China. That's where Hong Kong media comes into play. Um, although we are part of China, we enjoy a lot of um, freedom of expression, freedom of publication. So these are the main pages on Hong Kong's main Chinese language and English language newspaper. We cover the death in, in very, very great details uh, running obituaries of what the man, uh, who the man was. And why is that? Because of Hong Kong's unique history. Um, the picture on the left was uh, dated back in the 1980s. That's when Hong Kong was still a British colony and the leaders were negotiating Hong Kong's future. And they ended up giving Hong Kong a lot of freedom unseen in mainland China. Ended up in the um, picture on the top right hand corner, the handover ceremony. And of course, all of you might have remembered the Umbrella Revol uh, Revolution or Umbrella Movement. Uh, in 2014, uh, giving Hong Kong people a lot of political freedom to go on the street, but that also highlights the lack of political freedom because Hong Kong people, they are still fighting for democracy. And what's happening? 
Um, it, as China is growing stronger, um, below are the three uh, areas of study that I will go into. The first is that major media outlets in Hong Kong, they are uh, increasingly in the hands of moguls with business interests in mainland China. The, left one, the TV channel on the left is the um, most liberal TV channel in Hong Kong. And a few months ago, 30% uh, of its shareholding actually went to uh, one of uh, the four main developers, property developers in Hong Kong. Whereas on the right, the main English language newspaper, the South China Morning Post, is, uh, has been bought by China's richest man, Jack Ma, of the Alibaba Group uh, two years ago. So what's happening? The second aspect I'll be looking into is self-censorship. Well, self-censorship has always existed in Hong Kong, um, but the change is it is stepping up. And according to this leading author in Hong Kong, a media studies author, uh, he calls the situation more and more institutionalized. And he actually identified 20 ways to self-censorship in Hong Kong nowadays, and he broadly um, categorized the, the, the phenomenon into eight subgroups. And I think uh, the first three are actually quite scary in terms of um, the problems facing Hong Kong media workers. Like um, they are asking, for example, the bosses will be asking for balanced reporting, uh, but that's usually tilted towards those in power, like you have to get this kind of people for comments to, to be balanced. But um, a lot of times, from the journalist perspectives, uh, it is actually not balanced because um, you're actually giving them too much exposure, too much media reporting, and on the other hand, you're not giving equal uh, opportunities for democracy people, democracy groups, for example. And the second one is uh, how you turn, you, you have blind belief in authorities and government sources, because a lot of times the Hong Kong government will be giving you a lot of information which you cannot really verify. But I'll, I'll stop there and go into my third categories, which is the Chinese uh, state security agencies, they are directly manipulating Hong Kong media. Uh, on the left, it was one of the booksellers' case in recent years. Uh, there's a Chinese citizen who is running a bookstore in Hong Kong selling very sensitive publications. Uh, he was arrested by Chinese authorities. And what did the Chinese authorities do? They asked Hong Kong media to talk to him in detention. In that kind of environment, of course, the, convicted per uh, the arrested person is not going to say whatever he wants. But um, the Chinese authorities, they are asking Hong Kong media to conduct this kind of staged interviews f to give them exposure, um, to undertake basically propaganda agendas. So according to the Reporters Without Borders, um, it's a very pessimistic view. Um, Hong Kong media, we are doing our worst in 20 years. And, but despite the pessimism, I think there is still some good journalism going on. Uh, for example, the, on the right, uh, she is a marvelous woman. She is the wife of uh, one of the arrested human rights lawyers in China. Her husband has been missing for 1,000 days already by last week. And you can see all the TV channels, all the uh, microphone um, stuff. They're all actually Hong Kong media working in Beijing. Of course, there's no Chinese media going to interview him, her or, or him or other people involved. But it's Hong Kong media playing the role of holding the, um, China, the state of China accountable. And on the left, it is one of the greatest investigative journalism networks newly founded in Hong Kong, uh, which, is, which is also gaining a lot of support. So I will stop here. And if you have any information or any inspiration for me, feel free to approach me afterwards. Thank you very much. Yeah, now, as, as promised, we still have some time for questions. If you have any, um, we're happy to answer them. been able to implement any changes since you've gone back in terms of have you been able to use some of the stuff you've learned to actually change anything in your own organizations? Next third? 
Okay, um, then I'll, I'll go first. I came back to Vienna in December, and um, of course, in my um, newspaper, they were very curious to hear what I've learned. But I also had to disappoint them a bit because they kind of expected that within two months I would have become a coder. And <laughs> so it, it's a lot about lobbying. So I had to tell them, no, we, we need to get a coder. And, and the things like this are still um, a bit difficult because, yeah, you do need the commitment even from the top. And enthusiasm on the bottom is not enough, as I said. Um, but we also, we're actually looking for somebody now. So at least uh, one coder in the team would be really great. <laughs> and I'm, I'm hoping for it. And, um, and there was a lot of um, talk in the data journalism scene kind of after this paper because I think everybody was very keen to hear about what others are doing. Well, based on one, at least a couple of interviews I did for this where there was a strong call for more transparency in reporting and how we did, I've been trying to propose that to my newspaper and the editor-in-chief is very open, but he says, I have to do it. You know, <laughs> on top of all, the, it's not that I'm taking out of the daily news circle to start something. He said, this is great. Can you also hold a presentation for this staff? So, I mean, it's... Uh, it's the constant lack of resources, but they're very uh, open to, uh, I mean, they also want to learn what we learned, so it was, it's been very useful. So if there are no more questions, uh, we're happy to answer them one-on-one, and we stay, stick around a little longer. Thank you. <laughs>